our ending, where we have to live with our consequences. Huh. So this may be its own video, I don't know. So I'm going to put a break here and we'll see how this plays out. Worst come to worst, I'll just splice it together, so wait and see. I don't think I slept a single wink that night. I tossed and turned, rumbling the duvet around me, so Sally moaned and mumbled at me to knock it off because her feet were getting cold. But I didn't fall into the land of dreams. Even if I had managed it, I doubt I would have had any dreams. More like nightmares. Pale limbs, long and slender. Sooty black hair. Bright green eyes. The other clue was how they both like the same type of ice cream. I kind of forgot to mention that one in the previous video. Bell. Or is it Melody? Did any of that really happen? I don't know. Thoughts waltz around my head, but my body is slow and sluggish to process them. I can't keep up with the rapid movements of my mind. My head is filled with too many thoughts. The neural pathways inside my brain congested. But I'm so exhausted, it's all I can do to keep my eyes open. My eyelids feel heavy, as though weighted down by lead. When the cheerful chirping of the birds greets me around 6 a.m., I want nothing more than to smother myself with the pillow. They had never sounded more shrill or insistent, not even on days when I have to wake up early and go to work. It's cold outside, but it feels far too hot and stuffy in the bed. Maybe it's because of Sally. Her body is soft and warm, filled with blood vessels and slowly digesting pork pie. That's what we had on our picnic yesterday in Whitby. We had to eat it in the car, given the torrential rain. I ate, my throat convulsing, while my neck was marked with Belle's insistent, fervent kisses. I hear Sally rising from the bed around half-seven. She yawns and sighs, stretches and begins her daily routine, divesting herself of her white, almost childlike nightgown, and fishing her favorite blue jeans from the wardrobe. Sally is one of those strange people who, after taking off her clothes at the end of the day, hangs them back up in the wardrobe. She doesn't scatter garments over the floor and tuts at me whenever I do it. Don't even think about it, mister. That's what she says. I listen to Sally getting dressed, hiding from humanity beneath the blankets. She's quiet. Perhaps for my benefit. Maybe she thinks I'm still asleep. She doesn't want to inconvenience me. Is it because she loves me? That makes it even worse. It would be easier if she hated me. If she finds out what happened yesterday, she really would hate me. Now that she would believe it, it's unimaginable. I don't know if I believe it myself. Yeah, I'm just cutting out that entire scene. They keep showing that CG, and I'm tired of breaking out the mosaics. He just kind of recounted the events of the night. I curl up on myself like a cat in a basket, trying to catch at least a few minutes of sleep. But it isn't to be. How can I sleep in this state? In any event, it's far too bright. Sunshine filters in through a crack in the curtains. The birds are still chirping. Don't they have anything better to do? Probably not. They are birds, after all. That would be expecting too much. I can't sleep. Maybe I'll never be able to sleep again. So I get up. What else can I do? I get up like it's any other day. I adjust myself automatically, though my fingers tremble, and pad over to the bathroom. Brush my teeth, comb my hair, shape my face. The regularity is almost soothing. Almost. There's something sickening about it. Like I'm trying to turn my back on the truth. How can I stand to look at my own reflection in the mirror? How can I? Fuck. I walk downstairs on trembling legs. I have to grip the banister tight. I'm worried one wrong move will make me fall and I'll end up battered and broken on the floor. That might be preferable to what will happen if anybody finds out about last night. Never mind about Sally. What would the papers say? Primary school teacher rapes own daughter. Doesn't sound great. Sounds terrible. I feel terrible. Good morning, Dad. So now you can finally see her CGs. Wait a minute. Dad. I stare, slack jawed eyes open. My expression is so exaggerated, it probably looked like a cartoon character. When I turn the familiar handle of the kitchen door, now rendered unfamiliar after the events of last night, I never expected to encounter this. Melody is sitting at the kitchen table. My Melody. My daughter, Melody Hawkins. It's her. 
It's undeniably her. Her long black hair falls about her bare shoulders, and a small smile flits across her lips. So I don't know about the hair length thing. I was thinking she might be wearing a wig when it's long or using some sort of hair extension or something. We'll see. And if you're wondering about the eyes, if they ever actually were green, you can just do that with contact lenses. That's not really that difficult. Her eyes are brown. Her eyes have always been brown. It is true she bears a striking resemblance to Belle. They have the same skinny limbs, the same slight stature, even the same bitten fingernails. But there are a few key differences so intrinsic between the pair they can't possibly be the same. They can't. Melody has Sally's nose and lips, but my eyes. That's because she's my little girl. My little girl, who hasn't come down to eat breakfast with me in, oh, so long I can't even remember. Months, maybe? A whole year? Not since Sally and I found her in the bathroom, curled up inside the tub. Her eyes were open, but just barely, and her chest rose and fell so subtly she could have been a corpse. She was so cold, limp, and lifeless, I almost thought she was a corpse. Melody tried to kill herself one year ago. Sally and I called an ambulance. We went to the hospital with her. Sally was crying. I was too surprised to do anything much other than swear under my breath. My knuckles clenched together. It probably looked like I was going to hit somebody. The doctors pumped her stomach. She was sick for a few weeks and had to take some time off school, but she was fine in the end. As right as rain, one of the nurses said. A smiley woman with caramel-colored hair. I like that nurse a lot. She made my awkward trips to the hospital almost bearable. Melody almost certainly never made an effort. She just sat in the hospital bed silently, like a statue, never saying a word. She seemed more interested in staring at the wall than at my face. It was almost like I had wronged her, which was ridiculous. She was the one who tried to kill herself. But maybe she was tired of making an effort. She must have been making an effort for a long, long time, until it all became too much. She wanted to kill herself, and I never even realized. After that, she became something of a recluse. She was always hiding away in her room. She never came down for breakfast. She walked herself to school. She graced us with her presence at the dinner table for five or six minutes per evening. That is when she bothered to come down at all. Even then, she never lifted her head, never looked at my face. Can it really be? After all this time, is she really back? Melody. Hey, Dad. Melody tips her head to one side. The sunlight shines in through the window, catching her hair so it glistens. For once, she isn't wearing one of those awful, oversized hoodies she favors. She's dressed in something soft and feminine that actually flatters her figure. And is displaying a bit of skin, too. I always knew she could look cute if she tried. She just stopped trying. I... I know I'm, I've worried you a little this last year. And I really am sorry. I was going through a hard time, Mom. Mom spoke to me yesterday after we got back from the trip. She said you were trying really hard, and... It made me think about some things. I thought, maybe I didn't appreciate everything you did for me. I know I can be kind of difficult. I don't think it'll make everything better, and it might be a little hard, but for what it's worth, I... She glances up at me beneath her eyelashes shyly, so demure it almost takes my breath away. She's far more beautiful than I ever dared to imagine. She became so beautiful in such a short space of time, and I missed it. I never noticed because I didn't pay attention. I'm sorry. It's fine, Melly. I mean... I cough. Obviously, things aren't fine. I don't know if they'll be fine for a while. I don't be delusional to say that they are, but... Robin. Sally rests a hand on my shoulder. She gives me a warning look. You're saying too much again. Yes, sorry. Melody laughs. She actually laughs. It's a light, gentle sound, soft and musical like a chiming bell. Bell. What do you think of Melody's new dress? It's pretty, isn't it? Oh, yes. I was just about to say it looks... Familiar. Oh, come on. Don't go all the way back to that CG. Disturbingly so. Okay, stop here. We're good. We don't need to see any more. Didn't I see that dress last night? Okay, thank you. I took 
took Millie out shopping a few weeks ago. She's been wearing nothing but sweaters and hoodies lately, and well, though she's never bothered with her appearance too much, she is a girl. I thought she might appreciate some new clothes. If you're in a rut, changing your wardrobe can help. It's rather simple, but human brains aren't overly complex. Sometimes we just need to change your pace. You're right, Mom. I feel a lot better now. I knew you would. You just had to trust me. Wait, so... Did you pick this dress, Sally? I thought it was cute. It was on sale. Isn't it a bit revealing? Oh, don't be silly. Millie's a teenager. She's old enough to show off a little bit of skin. She's not our little girl anymore. I was a little embarrassed to wear it at first. I don't usually dress like this, but Mom said it was, Mom was so insistent. Since she paid for it, I thought I might as well. And I was right. Sally smiles proudly, one hand on her hip. You look lovely, Millie. All the boys will be after you if you go out like this. Well, I don't know if I want that. It might be a bit much. Let's take it one step at a time. You don't need to be going to cocktail parties just yet. Well, I'm not old enough to drink. I don't think Dad would appreciate it if I started dating. He'll just have to get used to it. It's healthy to have one or two boyfriends at your age. I don't think you've had nearly enough life experience. That's what Joan Fowler says. She's right about that. You spent too long locked up inside your room. Well, I still feel a little self-conscious. But if I'll make you too happy, I... I can try to make an effort. That's really all we're asking, Millie dear. I'm so happy you've been feeling better. I really have, and it's all thanks to you two. It's because you never stopped supporting me no matter what. Of course, we're your parents, Millie. I know. Over the past few weeks, I think you've done far... You've done more for me than parents ever would. I know it might have been difficult at times, and it's not possible to rewrite the past. But we can try to start fresh. We can start over. Oh, Millie, do you really mean that? Yeah, I do. I really do. I love you, Mom, man. Melanie looks at me in askance, her hair spilling over her shoulders. Dark black against white ivory. Just like the keys of a piano. I really do love you. Dad? No escape unlocked. And the title card has changed. So I don't know what's all in extras, there was supposed to be some things actually here worth looking at, namely the author's notes. Wow, it's like reading another book. <laughs> Hello everybody, and thank you for reading Sweetest Monster. If you're here, that means you've finished reading the ending, and I wonder what you think of it. But you survived, and that's the most important thing! This visual novel has been in production for a while. I wrote the script in August 2015, then spent a very long sitting on it. Time sitting on it, I guess? Also because I was worried what people would think. This story is quite different from anything else I've written, and I also think it's meaner to the reader. Now, I believe this isn't the author's first game, it's just the first one I've played. And, to be honest, I'm not sure if I'm going to look at the other stuff the author has done. <laughs> at the time I wrote this, VNs like Nikopara and the Sakura series were, and still are, the most popular best-selling VNs on Steam. As such, I decided I should try writing something fanservice -y too. I mean, that's what sells. I haven't played either of those. Well, if it's a series, I haven't played any of these, and I haven't played this one. So I can't really comment on how it compares. However, I don't think the story ended up over too overtly fanservice-y. The atmosphere throughout is pretty creepy, with lots of washed-out color palettes, a gloomy, rainy setting, and the eerie music. My general aim was to write a VN with fanservice elements, but whose primary goal was to unsettle the reader rather than titillate them. As the visual novel medium is quite full of fanservice stories already, I thought it would be interesting if I was going to write a fanservice visual novel to make it a bit different. And as such, the story feels kind of punishing towards the readers, because the plot twist exists more or less to make you feel bad, to make the fanservice scenes that preceded uncomfortable in hindsight. Joke's on you, dude, I actually saw this coming. I know there are many, many more VNs out there that couple more graphic H scenes with more disturbing content, such as Song of Saya, 
and I don't know what this Kiku Ku guy is, but I've heard of Song of Saya. So, this story isn't that unique at all. It's actually quite tame compared to a lot of Japanese visual novels. Even so, I hope the story and the characters are well written enough for it to be affecting. If the story is able to make you feel uncomfortable, I would be very happy. Yeah, unfortunately, you didn't quite make it that far. Had I actually gotten caught off guard, I might have been, but... Yeah, I picked up the clues when they came, so... Yeah, one of the downsides about being a hero is you are hyper-aware at times. And by times, I mean very, very often. To the point where it's more rare to be off-guard than hyper-aware. One of the biggest inspirations of this visual novel is Nekopara. I don't know Nekopara, so I can't actually explain anything about this uh, on how true it is, how accurate, etc. Probably obvious given the, cat it, uh, the heroine is a cat girl, but there's a bit more to it. Nekopara had stayed at shop a lot and slowly dubbed towards Kasho because he nursed her back to health when she was sick. Vanilla being Vanilla loves shock a lot, and only really engages in Kawhi 3P action because it will make her sister happy. And she's fond of Kasho as he also took care of her. So... I don't quite know what all this means. <laughs> they have some interesting name schemes there. While I was reading, I thought, this is cute enough in a fictional story, but what if you applied it to real life? What if a person decided to devote their entire... their being entirely to another because they happened to help them out once? That seemed a little too intense. As such, I try to present Belle's obsession with Robin as discomforting than charming, and maybe even selfish. Well, Robin is flattered about the attention, he's also uneasy, and would have been a lot happier in the long run if Bella had just left him alone. Another big inspiration for this move of this story was the Korean movie Old Boy, directed by Park Chan Wook. I won't go into details as to how exactly it was an inspiration, but if you've seen the movie, it should be apparent. I'll also recommend it because it's very good. I'm guessing some sort of incest angle or something? Finally, I took some of Belle's personality from Sylvia Plath's poem, Lady Lazarus. Lady Lazarus is a rather dense and complicated poem that is probably about repeat suicide attempts, but the final line of it stuck out ever since I read it. And I eat men like air. I was always fond of this line, and wanted to try writing a femme fatale who embodies this general sentiment for a while. I guess it sounds kind of pretentious, though. Can't really comment because I'm not familiar with the source material at all. The themes of the story is a little hard since they're all over the place and not 100% cohesive, but I'll give it a shot. The main theme, I suppose, is the presentation of fan service in visual novels. That's actually kind of interesting. If you asked me what the main theme was, I would have actually said something about the dissolution of the family unit or something about how families are just falling apart these days. People don't really communicate as much in the digital age. All this stuff can be happening right in front of you, but unless you're looking at it through a lens, you don't freaking notice it. Like, those were the types of things I could find more believable. The fact that Melly had all these problems, Robin never did a damn thing to do anything. How he's kind of neglecting his wife in addition to his daughter. His, like, he doesn't even have any reason to because his job isn't really that great. So he can't really throw himself into work. The whole question is, what is he doing other than just sitting there and wallowing, and the answer is probably nothing. But anyway, back to the topic of fan service. I feel like a lot of fan service include visual novels for the sake of the reader, to make them feel good. But often there is no plot relevance for it. In fact, some of fan service visual novels on Steam don't have plots at all. They're just excuses to string images of scantily clad anime girls together. Okay, I want to go into more detail about this. I'll get to it in a second. I actually want to read the whole thing, just so I can do it as one cohesive thing. Moreover, in fan service visual novels, girls will generally trip and fall over to expose their panties by accident, get tangled up in wires out of adorable stupidity, or get walked in on while changing slash in the bathtub, because that's how life is fun. It is in fun and happy visual novel land, I guess. I wanted Belle to have a bit more agency than that. All fan service games in the story occur because of her. Scenes in the story occur because of her. She's supposed to feel like the one in control, and she instigates everything of her own free will. Moreover, she's only able to be in control because she's taking agency away from another character, Melody. Melody should be a lot more important than she is. If you remember, she doesn't make any appearances in terms of art until that final scene. Part of that is probably due to the sake of the twist, because you might see the similarities if you actually saw her, rather than just trying to picture her description. But she never gets her own spoken dialogue, and she doesn't even have a sprite. 
That isn't because of budget reasons, I swear. It's supposed to represent how little impact Melody has in Robin's life and how little he pays attention to her. She's his daughter, but they never speak to one another. They never speak one to one in the story, and if they had, it probably wouldn't have ended so poorly. A typical brand of fans are seeking visual novels is appealing, I think, because it makes cute female characters powerless. If we assume a lot of popular visual novels on Steam are fantasies made primarily to appeal to male egos, the male MC is the one in control, and the story slash universe slash characters exist solely for the sake of the man, or the sakes of shrewd companies who are making bank by selling this stuff. The oh no, I have tripped and now you can see my panties brand of fan service has always been felt a bit voyeuristic to me. And I think there are some powerful elements involved. So I wanted to write something that feels like it should be a male fantasy but disempower the male lead. However, one of the main female characters, Melody, is also disempowered. And unlike the cute airheaded heroines of many fan service visual novels, she ends up suffering because of it. Maybe the theme is just let's make everybody miserable then. Sounds about right. Yeah, Fata Morgana beat to that by a huge, huge margin, man. But to go back up here. So, regarding the whole visual novels on Steam, I've noticed this, and that's why I've been trying to highlight the visual novels that aren't fanservice-y. I know some of the commenters have actually said stuff about this. Just go ahead and take the plunge, play the fanservice ones, play the ones that are uh, full-blown sex sims or whatever. And... Well, I kind of walked into that with Sunrider. I'll admit that one. Granted, I'm one of those people who's pulled in for the whole strategy thing. And I'd like to say, some of you may say, sure, yada yada yada, but... Like, I never went back and played the third game when it had all the other routes included. I kind of missed the whole strategy genre, but that's a topic for another day. Probably when Sunrider 4 comes out, which will probably be years from now. And I pretty much agree with this. For the novels, I don't really play these just to see the girls, etc., etc. Or actually, I don't even, do I have any of that? Huh? I don't actually know if I. Maybe Sunrider's the only one I own that are kind. It's kind of like this. But yeah, they don't really have much going for them. When I play these types of games, I'm here for the adventure. That's why I'm playing World End Economica. That's why I took the plunge for Fata Morgana. And for the projects that are going to be coming out in the coming days, I don't know how long that's going to be, I still have to finish Natural. Ironically, I plan to be doing that during this time, but I wanted to wrap this up. So yeah, I actively try to steer away from those types of games, so... I can understand that. There's really just nothing more than the picture show. They don't really have anything deep, they're stock characters, it's stereotype central. Yeah. And then they mentioned Belle is a lot more aggressive here. She actually starts to initiate things herself. And in order to do so, she had to take everything from Melody. And I did notice this as we went through the game. I consider that evidence as the whole Melody is Belle theory I had early on. And then for the budget reasons, I don't know. You did have something for her at the very end, so I mean, if the author wanted to, he probably could have just modified that a little bit and put her in other places, but it wasn't really necessary, and if it's building for the twist, I can definitely see how it works. Then there's the whole symbolism here. Robin doesn't pay much attention to anyone, and my question is, what does he pay attention to? He's not worth thriving at work, his family is a quagmire. He doesn't even have a mistress or anything, so I have no idea. Then they mention that a lot of this is to try to appeal to people, and I guess it probably is for male egos, but as I found out in the days leading up to this one, there are a lot of women who actually play those games too. I don't know why, I don't really try to understand why, but I don't know. I legitimately don't know. So, yeah, but the whole miserable thing, I... My argument, though, would not be the theme. This There's not really much to have to do with fan service here. You get the whole innuendo with the popsicle, you get the upskirt shot, and then you get the last scene. But I see a much, much stronger case for how life has changed. People getting absorbed in work, how work is unfulfilling, 
how work is not truly rewarded, how these days workers are disposed of with really no second thought. That's one of the reasons why the economy is in the mess it is right now. All those experienced workers are just being tossed out without any regard, no safety net, nothing. And then the family life that suffered as a result for that job went unrewarded, the family is falling apart, divorce rates are sky high, children are having all sorts of issues. And then you can actually see this reflected in the schools themselves, and I could go on for a long time about this, but that's my argument that this game has a different theme. It may not have been intended, but I think that one actually did take center stage when everything was said and done. Names were all chosen for a specific reason, since I had a clear image. They're a little on the nose, though. First up, you have Robin. Want to name after a bird, since the hero is a cat girl, and cats eat birds. Tough luck, Robin. Robins are kind of small and defenseless. Last name Hawkins, because he's taken from a bird. Hawks are a bit more intimidating. Last name of the protagonist in Treasure Island. I get the feeling Robin would have been in boys' adventure stories when he was younger. Hmm. Next is Sally. Her name doesn't tie in any theme. It doesn't represent of anything. I just wanted a name that would split into cute nicknames like Sal or Sally Pally. I took some inspiration from romantic poet Coleridge, who nicknamed his wife Sarah Sally Pally. If you read my previous visual novel, Asphyxia, you might already know I'm quite fond of my romantic poets. I haven't actually read... Th I do not own this, I have not read it, but that was the one that actually stuck out to me. I don't know if I'm actually going to go back for it, or though, or not. Plus, I don't actually know how the author feels about me uploading this in the first place, so there is that issue, too. After that is Melody. Her name is pretty simplistic. It represents Robin's desire for her to be musically inclined. She continues to get referred to as a diminutive nickname in the story Melly because she was able to fulfill those expectations. Having a name that reminds you, you constantly failed your father's expectations must be quite a downer. Bell also points out during the narrative how ill-fitting her name is. Then the main female character, Bell. I wanted to give her a cute name that would also suit a pet cat, one that could possibly be used for a girl. Bell is musical, so which ties in the return, recurring motive of motif of music. In that sense, maybe it's a bit sad that Melody, whose name is a bit more musically explicitly music-related, should end up being upstaged by Belle, whose name is more tangentially linked. So yeah, I can kind of see the argument for all of these. Now, there weren't any explanations for the side characters. I don't know if there was anything important about them or not. They ultimately did not play that big a role. The main character in Sweetest Monster would be Robin. He was intended to be somewhat similar to male protagonists seen in many visual novels. Sarcastic and cynical, who occasionally makes dry jokes. However, he's a lot older than most visual novel protagonists, and is meant to be more world-weary. He's at least twice their age. I think his age was stated to be like 42. And your average visual novel protagonist will range from 15 to around 22, I want to say. And then the actual range there term depends on how explicit the novel is. As it gets more and more explicit, they get higher and higher in age. If you're wondering about the 18 to 22 thing, that's because of college years. Although it would be kind of interesting to see one where they're actually a little bit older. I'm trying to think. Sickness, the kids actually were like 17 to 18. Suo and Sarah. Another example of one of those ones I play that's more about the adventure than the fan service. Even though I did use fan service thumbnail for at least one of those videos. <laughs> Robin personally is a challenge myself, so I'm not comfortable writing main male characters, particularly adult males. Robin's not meant to be an entirely likable character, I suppose. His worst trait would be how neglectful he is towards Melody. At the same time, however, he isn't supposed to be a bad person. He says and does a lot of callous things, but it's not entirely deliberate. He's not a malicious character. He's thoughtless. Sally, meanwhile, was tricky to write. I want the reader to understand why Robin feels infatuated with her, so she's often the one who instigates arguments, and some of her accusations are off-base like your suspicion is having an affair with Arabella. However, I didn't want Sally to be entirely dislikable a character, or seem too unreasonable, it would be too easy to paint her as a nagging wife with no redeeming features, especially as the story is told from Robin's perspective. Therefore, Sally is shown to be a caring mother who loves Melody a lot, and she loves Robin too, though the monotony of their marriage has taken some of the initial spark away, and while they... and they while most of their time away arguing. As for Melody, I think she has some depth to her, despite receiving no spoken dialogue. She's depressed and has social anxiety and tried to commit suicide and failed before the beginning of the game. She keeps herself to herself, rarely interacts with her family, and doesn't have many friends at school. 
She feels misunderstood and isolated, yet continues to isolate herself because she worries about burdening others. And her relationship with Robin is very strained. Robin regards her depression as a personal failing. This only happened because I'm a bad father. He feels guilty when he's, when he's around her. Melody in turn realizes that her father is disappointed in her, and so Melody feels guilty when she spends time with him. I wanted to try and write a story about a depressed character from the point of view of somebody who does not have depression and could not understand it. That's the case of most people, I'm afraid. I don't know if the author is British or just wanted a British setting, but... Mental illness does not seem to be treated seriously anywhere in the world, I'm afraid. And it's just really, really sad. As Robin cannot fix the issue and feels out of his depth, his ultimate solution is to ignore it, like most people. But this makes their relationship even worse. Last of all, there's Belle. She came from a desire to write a very outgoing and vivacious female character. I want her to be energe energetic, maybe even a bit of a ganky girl. But there's also something unsettling about her. She's possessive, pushy, and doesn't respect other people in the slightest. Though she has a great deal of affection for Robin and threatens to harm the others around him, I wouldn't term her as a Yandere. Right? She isn't the kind of character who would snap under pressure and try to cause others physical harm. In the end, her feelings for Robin are also questionable, though she likes him. It's unclear if she loves him or if she's just playing around to alleviate her own boredom. Despite the fact that Belle is easily the most morally bankrupt character I've ever written, I'm quite fond of her. I think she plays off Robin's more deadpan delivery well, and their dialogue together was fun to write. So, yeah, those are my thoughts on the entire thing. As for the game itself, I'd have to say I'm satisfied. I saw the thing coming, but maybe it caught some of you guys off guard. I tried not to call attention to it since... It may have ruined things for you guys. Since this has no multiple endings, no choices to be made, if ruining the twist early would have probably ruined any value for you guys. If you want to pick it up yourself, I think it's like six bucks. It's on sale on Steam currently. Although by the time this video is uploaded... I'm trying to do some math here. I want to say the sale will end by the time this is out. This might actually be going up on Valentine's Day, which will be kind of awkward. I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, Swedish Monster. Fun little diversion, and hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be doing any games that fall into what the author was talking about. I do have one other one that I can recall. I don't know if I'm going to... I plan on doing it, I just don't know when... But in the meantime, I wanted to do a bunch of these smaller projects as World End Economica continues. And if the opportunity arises, I'll actually start the second big project. But anyway, that's Sweetest Monster. I'm satisfied. Are you? I'm the Hero of Light. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.